Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. Every once in a while, I love to read viewer feedback. I want to dedicate an episode reading your feedback, your comments, the emails, the questions that come in, and the show topics. You guys send me great messages and leave great comments. And so I did want to highlight a few in this episode, including some hot button topics like my uh, episode on modesty, as well as the topic of extra ecclesium nulla salus outside the church, there's no salvation, suicide, uh, confession, all sorts of things in this episode. So that is coming up. Before we do so, I would like to encourage you, especially all the men out there, please consider coming to our men's retreat, Strength and Honor, this August, at the beginning of August. It is for men of all ages, young and old, and uh, we're going to have a panel of young guns talking about the faith, the younger Catholic crew here at Church Militant, the guys, as well as talks from Michael Voris, Simon Rafe, and Jesse Romero. And it's going to be a time of uh, really great encouragement specifically for the men out there who want to live out their Catholic faith in a truly authentically masculine way. It'll be a time of great fellowship and encouragement that you'll leave very spiritually refreshed. Men only, women are not allowed, so I won't be able to be there, but that's fine because I want all of you guys to get together and strengthen one another in the faith. All you have to do is go to churchmilitant.com forward slash strength dash honor to sign up. Okay, so let's go ahead and read one comment that was left on my February 14th episode titled Demon of Brownsville Road. If you recall, that's the case about the uh, demonically infested home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, involved Bob Cranmer, who was the owner of that home. They were Protestants at the beginning of, of the ordeal. And after the end of it, which involved a couple years of a team of exorcists having to come to this home and offer masses and blessings and prayers and all sorts of things, the entire family became Catholic. Pretty amazing story. So I I suggest go watch that. It was one of my most popular episodes. It's the February 14th episode, Demon of Brownsville Road, an amazing story. Uh, And this house had all sorts of dark history attached to it. It was a, a former illegal abortuary where many children were actually killed uh, in the home in the early 20th century when abortion was illegal. And not just that, there was a uh, a Native American war battle that took place on the grounds. And so buried on the grounds of that very home were a mother and her three children. And so all sorts of evil attached to that home leading to this demonic infestation and the need to bring in some Catholic exorcists. Now, at at the end of that episode, I asked everyone to join me in praying the Hail Mary for Bob Cranmer's son, who unfortunately, and he believes very much owing to the psychological trauma that his son endured growing up in this demonically infested home. In fact, his son stayed in the very room that was the most affected. And it would only be later on that they'd found out after doing their historical research that it was that very room where the abortions were taking place. And that was the very room that not only most of the demonic manifestations were taking place, but also a lot of psychological, emotional attacks as well. And unfortunately, his son was never able to overcome that. He joined the military and uh, at, a, at a very young age, in his mid-20s, he actually ended up killing himself. So he committed suicide. So I asked our viewers to join me in a prayer for his son. At the end, we prayed the Ave Maria. And uh, someone objected, named Tomas. He left a comment saying this, do you know that you can't pray for people who committed suicide since they are in hell? Well, Tomas, <laughs> that's not exactly Catholic teaching. It's a bit more nuanced than that. Let me read from our catechism, 2283. Quote, we should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to him alone, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. The church prays for people who have taken their own lives. 2282 says, Grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. Now, traditional Catholic teaching has always been that suicide is a mortal sin, and it's still a mortal sin. You do not have the authority to harm yourself. We were very used to the mantra, my body, my choice. Well, there are certain things you are not allowed to do with your body because why? 
God is the one who has rights over your body. Not you, ultimately, it's God. And God has sent certain rules and parameters that we cannot cross, one of them being harming oneself, killing oneself, suicide. And so it is a mortal sin. But as our catechism says, there are things that can diminish our personal culpability. And there can still be, you can still have hope, and you should indeed pray for people who've committed suicide. You should. I'm going to share a very interesting anecdote with you. And it's a pre-Vatican II anecdote so that nobody can say, oh, it's just modernist, whatever, post-Vatican II. Pre-Vatican II by one of the holiest men to have ever walked the face of the earth, St. John Vianney. He's the patron saint of all parish priests, wonder worker, fought physically with the demons, and was known to spend many, 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 many hours every single day in confession. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims flocked to his little town of Aux just to meet with him. This is a man who could read hearts. Absolutely amazing man. When I was living in France, I bought a biography of his written in French, one of the best, I've probably the best out there as far as I'm concerned. And there was one anecdote that I read that has always remained with me. It was involving a suicide. There was a French widow living during the time of St. Jean Vianney. She was absolutely distraught because her husband of many years had committed suicide. He had jumped off of a bridge and killed himself that way. And seeking solace, she came to the city of Ars to go meet with St. Jean Vianney, hoping that he could give her some words of consolation. This is a woman, who, a very devout Catholic widow. She had spent decades praying the rosary for the conversion of her husband, who, wasn't, who, who did not lead a good Catholic life. And then he died committing suicide. So she was certain his soul was in hell, and she was absolutely distraught. She was wondering, I prayed all these rosaries for him. I, I, I had prayed so hard to God, I cried. And yet this is how he ends, and, and she just could not get over it. So here she is making a pilgrimage to Aux. Many, many other pilgrims had flocked there as well. And she's walking along the road, St. Jean Vianney is coming this way with the crowds with him. He sees her, and because he has the gift of reading hearts, he knows immediately what is troubling her. And he stops, and he says words to the effect of, take heart. Between the bridge and the water, God granted your husband the grace of one final act of contrition. And it was owing to the many years of rosaries that you prayed for your husband, that this grace was granted by God. Take heart. And her entire countenance and demeanor changed. Now she was flooded with joy and consolation, simply knowing her, her husband's soul was saved. This was from St. Jean Vianney himself. So those out there who are suffering because their loved ones committed suicide, and perhaps you spent many years praying for those souls, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. You can pray for those souls. And something else to remember as well. Padre Pio, he was asked whether or not one could continue praying for a person, even though that person had died many, many years ago, perhaps in a, in a bad way. And Padre Pio said, yes, you can. Why? Because God is outside of time. God stands in the eternal now. He's not restricted by the constraints of time as we are. And so when we pray, God can take the graces and merits of those prayers and he can apply them at any moment of history that he wants. So in a sense, he can apply them backwards in time, which is a really amazing thing. If you think about it, you can read about historical uh, tragedies, like for instance, the, the Titanic and how many people died in these terrible circumstances. You can actually pray for those individuals in their final moments. You can say, God, Please give those people strength in their final moments. Give them consolation. Please do whatever you can to eliminate their suffering and help them to, to die in a state of grace. Even though they passed on many, many, many decades before I was born, but I know because God is outside of time, he can take the graces and merits of those prayers and he can apply them backwards in time to those final moments of those souls who suffered on the Titanic. If you have someone that you know who committed suicide, who maybe died a terrible death, you can continue to pray for that soul. And you can ask God in his mercy, please take the merits and the graces of these prayers and apply them to that moment when um, they killed themselves. 
Ultimately, it's God's will, whatever he decides to do, and every single decision he makes is just, whether or not to have mercy upon that soul and grant them an, an act of contrition or something like that, or whether to allow that soul to go to hell. It's ultimately, it's entirely up to him, and he is completely just, he's completely good, and every decision of his is perfect. But that's certainly something that people can can remember and, and take heart uh, take to heart concerning any souls that they are worried about. All right, let us go on to another hot button topic. This is the extra ecclesium nulla salus, meaning outside the church there is no salvation. It is a dogma of the church, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about this dogma. Now, I'm not going to unpack all the nuances of everything in this uh, in this one episode. Don't have time to do that. But there were some objections from people when I did my May 11th episode on uh, Candace Owens. It's titled Candace Becoming Catholic, question mark, because she was talking about where she is in her faith. Her husband is a Catholic, but now she says she is really beginning to seriously consider the claims of Catholicism because of conversations that she's had with her husband. And so she is actually attending mass more frequently with her husband and thinking about the claims of Catholicism. Now, I said one comment in my commentary, and I got a few people responding to it, reacting to it. Let's hear what I had to say. And this is not to knock Protestants in any way, because I know that there are some wonderful people. I met some really wonderful people of goodwill who I believe will make it to heaven sooner than, than some of the Catholics I know, because they were such good souls, truly, authentically good souls. All right, so that episode is actually very well received, loads and loads and loads of positive comments and many people saying that they would start praying for Candace regularly. And I thank you for that because she she needs all those prayers and believe me, God's going to apply the graces of those prayers to her soul. I do believe that one day she will become Catholic, but keep praying for her, please. We did have a handful of people though, who challenged me on that little bit saying, oh, does Christine deny the dogma of outside the church, there's no salvation? You know, she's saying really that that anyone can go to heaven, that you don't have to be Catholic, etc. First of all, no, I do not deny that dogma. I don't deny a single dogma of the Catholic Church. I very much believe that outside the church, there's no salvation. What does that mean, however? What exactly does that mean? What it means is that every single grace that comes into this world only comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, through his Catholic Church, out into the world. It's not only in the Catholic Church where the graces remain. Obviously, the Catholic Church contains the fullness of the faith. She contains all the sacraments. She contains the fullness of truth. But the graces that come through her do spread out to the rest of the world. But they come through her, through Jesus Christ, through his Catholic Church, out to the rest of the world. So that as the Church teaches, there are other religious communities, other faith-based communities, um, faith communities that also have graces, maybe not to the same degree, to the same measure, but they still have grace. For instance, Protestant communities baptize uh, their members. As long as they use the Trinitarian formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and they use water and they have the correct intention, as long as they do that, That sacrament is efficacious for that soul, even if it's being done in a Protestant community. If a baby is baptized by a Protestant pastor using the Trinitarian formula and all of that, that baby well and truly is baptized. His sins are forgiven. Same goes to an adult who has adult baptism in a Protestant church. If the Trinitarian formula is is used, that person's sins are forgiven. Baptism is efficacious. So that is grace. That is grace. That's just one example. Now, let me read from the Catechism of Pope Pius X. Again, another pre-Vatican II source so that nobody can come back and say, oh, modernist, you're quoting post-Vatican II stuff. Pre-Vatican II source, Catechism of Pope Saint Pius X on invincible ignorance, something the church has always taught, invincible ignorance. Quote, whoever finding himself without his guilt, that is in good faith, outside the church, had received baptism, or had at least the implicit desire for it, 
He also sincerely sought the truth and did the will of God as best he can, although separated from the body of the church, would be united to her soul and therefore in the way of salvation. All right, look at those words carefully. I'm going to leave them on the screen for a little bit. They're talking about souls of goodwill who are not technically Catholic. They're not part of the body of the church. However, they are of good faith, of goodwill, and they have the desire for baptism. And it does not have to be an explicit desire for baptism. In fact, I've, I've had that, um, you know, objection lodged against um, against individuals in the past saying, well, it must be an explicit desire. You have to, you know, literally want to be baptized. Otherwise, it, this doesn't apply. Well, very clearly here that it doesn't have to be explicit. It can be implicit, essentially meaning you are a soul of goodwill. You have a good heart. You genuinely desire the truth. And you you are outside the body of the church. You, you are still, in that sense, united to the soul of the church and therefore in the way of salvation. That does not mean you're guaranteed salvation. That's something different. You're on the path to salvation. Salvation is open to you, but you have to persevere in your goodwill and seeking the truth to its very conclusions. Uh, so ultimately, you know whether or not you're saved, that's, that's ultimately up to the individual. This doesn't guarantee salvation, but clearly it makes it um, clear that salvation is open to those who are invincibly ignorant outside the faith. That is the sense in which I meant what I said about these Protestants of very good will, truly good people, pure souls, who I think will make it to heaven before some Catholics that I know, because as we know, there are very many bad Catholics who don't follow the faith, who are unfaithful and reject, essentially they reject the teachings of the faith. And so they don't really have any right to claim heaven just because they call themselves Catholic, just because they officially are part of the Catholic faith. They're extremely displeasing to God. They don't have any right to claim heaven just because they are technically, you know, baptized in the church or they go receive the sacraments. My hope, of course, with these Protestants of goodwill that I knew is that that goodwill and that sincerity will eventually lead them to the fullness of the faith. It's one of the reasons I do this show, Forward Boldly. I don't confine my talks and discussions only to Catholics, as many of you know who've watched my show. Um, I try to address non-Catholics out there as well. You know, I try to get them to be a bit more open to the claims of Catholicism. Why? Not because I want to bash them over the head with truth, but because I myself was outside the faith for a number of years and the Catholic faith is, is absolutely amazing. It is a marvel in so many ways, and it's brought so much joy to my life because it is the truth. It's the fullness of the truth. And ultimately, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's not simply about rules and regulations. And the rules are, are important. They are key, and they are part of doing the will of God. It's, it's how you show love to God is by you obey. You obey God. You do his will. And, and that's actually one of the things I think Protestants get very, very wrong is when they say, well, faith alone, it's enough for you to believe. And, and then you're saved and you're saved forever. Once saved, always saved. No, I'm sorry. You, you read scripture all over the place. And it says, if you love God, obey his commands. That is a requirement to make it into heaven. You must obey his commands. That's doing and that's how you show your faith in God, is you obey his commands. As, as our Lord said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will make it to the kingdom of heaven. There are a lot of people out there living, living that way, you know, saying, oh, Lord, Lord, and having all these pious words, and they're not living lives consistent with the will of God. They don't get to go get to the very end of their lives and then demand that they get into heaven because they haven't lived according to his will. You have to live according to his will. It's not enough just to have faith. You have to show your faith through your works, as the book of James says. And it's one of the reasons why Martin Luther threw out the book of James and called it the epistle of straw, because the book of James contradicted Luther by saying, it is not, you are not saved by faith alone. James comes out and says that you are not saved by faith alone. This contradicted Martin Luther's, um, you know, made up dogma. So anyway, that is what I meant by that uh, comment in the Candace, Candace Becoming Catholic episode. Okay, and something else as well, which I thought was kind of cool, is uh, my March 21st episode on the Blessed Carmelite Martyrs of 
Compien, as a reminder, that was about these 16 Carmelite nuns who went to, to their death by guillotine during the French Revolution, the reign of terror. And the, uh, the reel that we posted on YouTube, at this point, it's actually very cool. At this point, it's gained 1.6 million views. You can see it right there. It actually, it's closer to 1.67 million views. It's almost 1.7 million views, which is actually very cool. We uh, post reels for every single episode of Ford Boldly, but I am so very delighted and pleased that this one in particular is the one that's received so many views because I think this message, the life, the witness of the Carmelite martyrs of Compiègne is absolutely remarkable and so powerful. I actually want to take a moment to play that reel right now. On July 17th, 1794, 16 Carmelite nuns were marched solemnly up the scaffold to go to their deaths under the guillotine. Now, these Carmelite nuns had been brought there on carts through the streets of Paris. They were chanting, praise to God. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness, in your compassion, blot out my offense. Now on execution days, it was normally very loud, lots of jeering, people throwing things at the would-be criminals. But today, an eerie silence reigned. The crowd looked upon this spectacle of 16 habits nuns going to their deaths with perfect serenity. When the nuns came to the scaffold, they knelt and they intoned a song of praise to God. One by one, they were killed. Ten days after their execution, Maximilien Robespierre, the architect of the Reign of Terror, was executed and the French Revolution came to an end. There is an undeniable link between the martyrdoms of these nuns and the end of the French Revolution. Now, there were a few people who left comments not really understanding how I could link the execution of the Carmelite nuns with the end of the Reign of Terror. And that's simply because the reel can only be 60 seconds long. And so they didn't watch the full episode where I explained the link. But essentially, the Carmelite nuns, when they were arrested two years earlier and kicked out of their convent under the new laws of France, the revolutionary, atheistic, godless laws of France, they offered themselves as victims to bring an end to the reign of terror. They offered themselves in a group saying, God, we give our lives to you, take our lives so that to, to bring an end to the reign of terror. And God granted them the grace of two years of preparation, of prayer, of preparation. And he finally accepted their sacrifice on that day when they were taken to their execution. And I was blessed to be able to actually visit France a few weeks ago and go visit the spot where they were executed right now. It's called Place de la Nation. There's a huge monument there to their public. And it looks completely different from how it looked before. But I wanted to play a short clip of myself standing in that, uh, that square and talking about the, the Carmelite nuns. Well, here I am in Paris on the spot of their execution. At the time, as I mentioned, it was called Place du Trône Renversé, Place of the Toppled Throne. Since that time, they've renamed it to Place de la Nation. There's this big monument here um, that's built in homage to, I guess, the, the Republic of France, the nation of France. But none, it, none of this was here back then, obviously. Uh, also, didn't have these buildings, didn't have all the traffic and the pavement or any of that. It was just an open square where these nuns were brought in on tumbrils, as I said, singing to their deaths, and an eerie silence reigned as all the people looked upon this amazing marvel, this amazing spectacle of these Catholic religious going with perfect serenity, even with their faces radiant, full of joy, to their deaths to meet their maker. And it's been a great blessing to be here in Paris, I've been able to visit some of the holy sites, including Basilique du Sacré-Cœur yesterday, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart on Montmartre. It sits on a hill of Montmartre. And it was actually built with money from the French government in reparation for the sins and crimes of the French Revolution. Because as we know, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of Catholics, many faithful Catholics, clergy, religious, and laity, went to their deaths during that time of intense anti-Catholic persecution. Sacré-Cœur has the longest continuous perpetual adoration in the world of 150 years 
of continual perpetual adoration. It was a great grace to be able to be back and take part in that adoration. And then we also went to visit Notre Dame de Victoire, Our Lady of Victories Church in Paris, which was a parish that was near and dear to the heart of St. Therese of Lisieux, as well as her family. She writes about it in her story of the soul. There's a little altar to St. Therese, as well as to her family. And she and her family obtained many, many graces going to Notre Dame de Victoire. And you can see throughout the entire church, marble plaques that were erected by individuals giving thanks to Our Lady for many, many graces, graces of healing or conversion or keeping family and friends safe through various dangers. I have absolutely wonderful memories of France and um, one, maybe, maybe, I'll dev- maybe I'll devote an episode to my time in France, especially, you know, the Catholic um, aspects of France. It's just, it was amazing. It was amazing. I treated it more as a retreat and a pilgrimage than as a vacation. We went to a number of different masses there and just so deeply and profoundly blessed by my trip to France. And I'm praying if you would, wouldn't mind offering some prayers for me that I could take all of my children there uh, one day very soon because there's so much rich Catholic history in France. And it really, the trip blessed me in every single way. It just blessed me so, so very much. Um, I left so enriched in the faith. And as many of you know, I'm, I'm part French. And so there's a part of my heart and soul that are still left in France right now. So when I think back, you know, there's a part of me that's a little bit sad and I wish I could, I could go back. But as I said, that God accepted the sacrifice of, of the nuns. And it's part of Catholic teaching of redemptive suffering, which is an actually beautiful teaching. It's something that Protestants do not have. And it's something that I thought was one of the most amazing things when I came back to the faith is the concept of redemptive suffering, that we can, can unite our sufferings, whether they be little or great, to the sufferings of Christ on the cross, we can offer them up to God in atonement for sins. Now, we don't have the power, like Christ himself, to atone for all the sins of the world. We don't have that ability. Only Christ's blood has that power. However, God himself has invited us to take part in his plan of redemption, to take part in his plan of salvation, which is a high honor that God has extended to us. And part of that is we may now unite our sufferings to those on the cross, meaning now our sufferings now take on an infinite dimension, an infinite um, uh, significance, and also they obtain graces, graces to help atone for our own sins, to help atone for the sins of others, which is why the Carmelite martyrs could say to God, please, we offer our lives to you, take our lives, end the reign of terror. And as we know, God accepted that, They died 10 days later. Robespierre himself was executed and the reign of terror came to an end. Now, I actually misspoke during that reel. I said that the revolution came to an end. I misspoke. What I meant was that the reign of terror came to the end. The French Revolution actually lasted for some more years. But the point is that this mass slaughter of Catholics, hundreds of thousands of Catholics, finally came to an end. Many thanks to the heroic martyrdom of these Carmelite nuns, as well as, you know, we can't forget the heroic uh, martyrdoms of many, many good Catholics, priests, monks, nuns, uh, and laity during that time. The most diabolical, uh, anti-Catholic period of French history ever in the history of France. All right, let's move to another controversial uh, topic, modesty. I did an April 11th show, Modesty Myths, and because the second half of the show was behind the paywall. Uh, There were a number of people who actually didn't see my explanation of the the, the church's position on modesty. So we had, I had some people writing in saying, oh, well, didn't the Pope issue an official decree on, you know, standards of modesty for, for dress and women? And why didn't you address that? And there were some people who were writing me and mad about that, et cetera. And I got so many comments on this. Again, I don't know why it is. I can talk about the most controversial, I can talk about murder and sex abuse and, you know, the, just the most controversial things in the world. But as soon as I talk about modesty, for whatever reason, I get an explosion of comments and reactions from people. It's like people have such strong feelings about this in, on both sides. But I wanted to very quickly address this lingering, well-intentioned myth that there is an official papal decree setting forth 
absolute standards of dress for women that apply to all times and all places. There are so many Catholic blogs and websites out there pushing what they call Marian modesty. Again, well-intentioned, and it's perfectly fine and admirable if people want to dress according to those standards. That's fine. I have no problem with that at all. I think it's very admirable. What I do have a problem with, though, is spreading the myth that this is the official church teaching, that the Pope himself decreed this, and therefore, if you are not following this, these standards, you are sinning. That's my problem with this. So here is the famous quote that we always hear from people pushing Marian modesty. Quote, and some pe sometimes people attribute it to the Pope. It's actually written by Cardinal Basilio Pompili. We recall that a dress cannot be called decent, which is cut deeper than two fingers breadth under the pit of the throat, which does not cover the arms at least to the elbows and does not fall a bit below the knee. That has been used to bash many a good Christian woman over the head with when they're wearing sleeves this short instead of down here or this because it's not two fingers breadth beneath the collarbone. Maybe it's three fingers breadth beneath the collarbone. And then they, they falsely attribute it to sometimes it's Pope Pius IX, other times it's Pope Pius XI, other times it's, oh no, it was this cardinal, but you know, the Pope endorsed it. People are all over the place. But here's the actual fact of it. First, there is a clause that comes right before that quote that everyone seems to leave out. And as far as I'm concerned, it's dishonest for people to leave this out. This is the clause that goes at the beginning of the quote I just read. Here's the full quote in context. Quote, in order that uniformity of understanding prevail in all institutions of religious women. Let's read that again. In order that uniformity of understanding prevail in all institutions of religious women. As we see, this quote is directed to institutions of religious women. And what's more, I hope you're enjoying the show. The rest of the show is behind the paywall. So please go to churchmilton.com to watch the rest. For those who are not premium subscribers, you can sign up at churchbuilding.com forward slash go premium. See you there.